fabulous because everybody else, I gave them the copy of it. I blanked out my name and the doctor's name. And I said, take this to Kaiser. They said, they don't do it. And I said, well, it's on Kaiser letter. Yeah, check it out. And they went and the doctor put their name in and signed it for them. So I felt really successful and productive in my experience, my adventure with Kaiser. I mean, I got a lot more to say, but go ahead, please. <laughs> Thanks, Dabalita. <laughs> um, yeah, I am also known as Dab Wilita. <laughs> Grandmother of six, he's a dab. Um, so I, I have to say I've had experiences all over the board. Um, when I was diagnosed, um, which is not a thing uh, for this particular syndrome, but the first time I, I went to a hospital after um, throwing up for 12 hours, having a really negative reaction and, and starting this whole hyperemesis loop thing, uh, the doctor very confidently came into the room while I was um, on um, benzos, which I had been asked to stay away from, but they just mainlined, you know, hey, calm down, calm down. And he sat on the edge of my bed and he said, well, it really makes a lot of sense to me that you're in here um, because, you know, you've overdosed on, on, you've overdosed on cannabis at the hemp convention that you were just at. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Oh, I'm an authority on this. I've been interviewed before. <laughs> um, meanwhile, I'm like, oh, great. Uh, and they're like, I'm so out of my mind. So, you know, that's one story. Another one more recently, I was really surprised um, at the, uh, the forward attitude of my dentist, um, who has nothing to do with cannabis. But more recently, I had some dental work done, and I was talking to him about what industry I work in, and he said, hey, 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 promise me you're not gonna smoke beforehand, because you know that can actually make it hurt worse. Have a joint lined up for afterwards, but THC beforehand, and I was like, wow, that's, I don't even know if that's true, but the fact that you're coming at me with that as preventative, like, that was really positive for me. And um, lastly, the thing that I'll say, I just, I would give a huge shout out in this particular bullet point to nurses and nurse practitioners, not just doctors, but the people that are actually interacting with you in a lot of these um, times that you go in. I was actually most recently in the hospital here in Seattle for 420 weekend, and um, you know, I came in presenting with all these same symptoms, and the nurse practitioner actually said to me, Hey, we're in Seattle, so I just want to let you know, please don't come in to the ER begging for opiates. There are other things that can help you down, which I've been conditioned to. Oh, I'm in a, I'm in a 12 hour barfing fit. I have to get, I have to calm myself down. This is the only way hospitals are going to respond to me. And she said, just so you know, your homeopathic remedies, your apple cider vinegar, your warm water baths, those things should be helping, but the opiates that you've been using have lessened their effectiveness. So I just think it's really fantastic in these places you don't expect the education to come from to actually listen to these people who spend hundreds of interactions with people in a similar manner. So it's been pleasantly surprising for me. So I was a patient before I was a doctor and it was some of the um, less than stellar experiences I had with doctors that made me want to become one. Um, I felt like I had to take matters into my own hands so I could you know, be there for friends, family, and, and patients everywhere just because I, I would, you go into a lot of doctors, they give you no time, they don't seem to know anything, um, and, um, and it really ranges. There's some amazing doctors out there, and I'll give you an example. Um, I have a friend who had brain cancer, and her oncologist um, he does research and look, reads articles, journal articles, and he suggested she take high dose CBD therapy. And that's like a really amazing story, and she did, and she's doing quite well now, but most doctors would not do that. And they would just tell you you're crazy. And so, um, you know, when I went to medical school at Bastyr, the endocannabinoid system was not even mentioned. It's not taught in medical school to this day. I understand a few medical schools are starting to teach it, but it's not something that has been traditionally taught in medical schools, nor is cannabinoid therapy. And so, um, you know, mainstream doctors are really under-equipped to help patients with cannabis, and and so that, that's a big problem, and I think it's getting better, but it's still huge, and it's still really hard for doctors to get good information about cannabis if they're not motivated to do so on their own, it's not given to them. And so another thing that's really interesting is I think it's 60% of mainstream medical procedures are not evidence-based. So there's all kinds of procedures, surgeries, really high intervention um, medical things where they will do things to you. They'll open you up, they'll cut you open, they'll risk your life. And there's no good evidence that that surgery is gonna cure what you have or even take away your pain and they do it anyway. And then with cannabis, you go into your doctor and you say you wanna get some cannabis and they're like, oh, there's no evidence for it. And so, 
they're willing to do surgery on someone with very little evidence, but they're not willing to have a conversation about cannabis. And so that's something that, um, that you know, I, I think needs to change, and I, I hope that the schools get better at teaching endocannabinoid system and cannabinoid therapy. But um, it's, it's definitely a really big problem, and I think there are doctors out there, like Sunil and lots of other ones who are who know about cannabis and they want to help their patients and, and they educate them, but that's not the normal, that's not the rule, that's the exception, and hopefully it'll become the rule one day. Thank you. Uh, so this question uh, I'm excited to ask, and it was suggested by one of our panelists. Thank you, Liz. I want to ask, what is the most effective piece of advocacy that you've done for yourself, for patients, or for the plant? Madeline, can you top what you did last time? <laughs> Well, um, you know, one of the I, one of the things that I feel has really been, if, if, in my position, one of my biggest successes was having the Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards, where people actually got to taste different samples of uh, local strains, then find which of them was most effective for their particular symptoms. And not many people were doing it when I started it. We did it for about 14 years, and it was really exciting. And I mean, I've had people cry in my arms saying. You helped me so much to find out what really works for me. And somebody gave me Northern Lights number five and it worked great on uh, my husband's back problem. It didn't work for me. So I think that finding out which particular strain worked most effectively for your symptoms was really, really important. And um, I thought that was it. You know, that was one of my, my, I felt honored to be able to serve them that way because it's such a struggle to grow something for four or five months and then to find out it doesn't even work for you. And uh, so yeah, that was my biggest success. And also uh, working symbiotically with my uh, physiatrist, you know, being able to educate him because he was young enough that he really wanted to be educated. He didn't think he was a genius, you know, he was like, if you have any material you think I should read, please bring them to me in that one. I follow your advocacy and blah, blah, blah. So that was really exciting to be able to educate my physiatrist. So. Oh, no, first. The main thing that um, next to me, the main 